Okay? Yeah. Very good. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be at this uh, summer school. I think it's a fantastic event. Um, right, um, I'm going to talk to you about cave monitoring, and it's all about um, measuring what a cave is like in terms of its climate and microphysical characteristics and the way that it uh, lives and breathes in relation, in response to changes in the outside environment. Now, it's not a particularly new science, this. Uh, some luminaries have recognised how important cave monitoring is for, for decades. But when you go back and read um, the literature and um, descriptions of uh, paleoclimate records from, from speed of them, um, there are assumptions which are made, which, um, which are sometimes very, very hard to understand where they come from. Um, caves are sealed, stable environments, unchanging over thousands of years, right? Of course. Carbonate deposition from groundwaters is a simple, well-understood process. I think so. And um, speed of them provide chemical proxy records that can be linked to specific aspects of the surface environment and regional climate. I wish it were that simple. Um, but... If, if, if this was remotely true, then if you go and sampled a few speed of them for a single cave chamber, then wouldn't you expect them to be rather similar in, in appearance, whether you've cracked them open and looked at the textures and the records inside them? And this is a small collection of our Gibraltar speed of thems, and there's such a wide range of textures and features. OK, I'm cheating slightly because there's a, quite a wide age range here as well. But uh, you get the point, that in order to make sense of these different fabrics, you need to understand really how the cave works and uh, what is causing those changes in colour and texture and isotopic composition and trace element composition. So why monitor? Well, it's very simple. Um, uh, Ian and Andy's book come up with the term the speed of them incubator. And it's a nice concept to think that speed of them are living things that require nutrients and certain conditions for, them to, for their survival. And cave monitoring is all about understanding the factors which drive or in, in, inhibit calcite precipitation. And the point is that, that this varies spatially within caves and also varies with time, seasonally. So this is one of the complications. And the upshot of this is that you might be able to locate parts of the cave which, which might give you a better record than others. Um, Monitoring is all about identifying and linking the responses of chemical proxies to, this, to the surface environment. Here, as we've heard in Ian's talk this morning, that um, trace elements particularly, they respond to different aspects you know, of, uh, of the climate, vegetation, ventilation, aquifer characteristics, etc. And a more subtle point is to quantify the fidelity of this recording process. This is all about understanding the extent of isotopic disequilibrium or equilibrium I doubt that, that many speed of them grow in complete isotopic equilibrium. Um, so how big is this disequilibrium effect? Does it vary with time? Um, is the proxy signal amplified or attenuated by these local cave processes? And more subtle still, is there bias in the record? Are you just capturing part of the seasonal cycle? Are you capturing just the summer climate or the winter climate or something like that? So all of these things. So what do you need to monitor? Well, there are th three aspects to this. There's, again, from Ian and Andy's book, um, a nice diagram here, Speedophysiology, which shows you the relationships between the exterior and the cave in terms of, uh, of heat, water, and gas exchange. So that's part of what it's all about. Then there are two very simple fundamental equations which, we, which we're using, knowingly or unknowingly, one is the carbonate formation equation, and the inputs and outputs of the carbonate formation equation, well, the out one of the outputs is CO2, so clearly CO2 degassing and the CO2 environment is important, but the inputs in terms of the water chemistry are obviously important here as well. And the other equation is the um, temperature equation between calcite and water, the extra isotopic fractionation, and there's a very big T in this, and temperature obviously plays a very important part in controlling that process. So a typical setup, this is um, a cave, this is a plan of a cave we've been monitoring in France, and there are various sites along the length of the cave. But what are you what you're measuring? If I can get this, yes, it will point. Um, ideally you'd have a surface monitoring station, a 
and to monitor the uh, meteorology and the soil conditions. And then deployed at various positions throughout the cave, you'd have sensors which would measure things like drip rate, temperature, um, at sites where you, whether, where you might want to or have already sampled studio film for your climate record. There's a transition zone between the outside and the interior of the cave where you know, seasonal or diurnal variations in temperature gradually get damped out and become more constant. And the same, the transition between background atmospheric CO2, the usual transition zone, and eventually you arrive at some higher level, which is more representative of the cave. Where did, how extensive is this transition zone? Does it read the time? Um, these are the things which, which you're interested in. So what are the relevant parameters? Um, this is a, to answer the question. Well, I don't know what questions you're asking, so I'm not going to address that at the moment, but that's clearly one of the most important steps is, is to try and uh, encapsulate really what you need to measure to, to answer the question which you're addressing in your project. One thing to bear in mind is that uh, not all measurements, not all monitoring can be done in the field. Some of the measurements you need to take the samples back to the lab. So you need to devise some form of best practice in terms of sampling and, um, and what you do with them, what you do with the samples when you get them back into the lab. Um, Continuous logging is highly desirable in that you deploy something, leave it for several months, years, and you come back and you get a lot of lovely data. Um, this works for some parameters, but not other parameters. And so which parameters can be monitored reliably and which are more difficult to do? I'll talk about those in a few minutes. And I'll pass briefly. This is something which is terribly attractive to everybody. How do you automatically sample water? How do you automatically sample air? Um, People have tried to do this um, with varying degrees of success. Technically, it's challenging because the cave environment is a very, it's quite a challenging environment to uh, have um, electronics and particularly mechanical systems. It's corrosive, there's condensing water. And so automatic sampling really is something which is uh, quite difficult to do, but it can be done. Okay, so the basic premise is to monitor. Well, I've split this diagram up into the surface environment and the cave environment and two fields, things which you can measure um, out in the field or in the cave and a series of measurements which you need to take samples and you bring them back into the lab. And I'll go through a few of these um, um, topics in the rest of the talk. Field monitoring, um, meteorology, particularly interested in air temperature, humidity, rainfall. You might be interested in wind, wind strength and direction which does have a bearing on uh, controls on from ventilation. We're very interested in the soil environment. We're interested in the soil temperature. We're interested in the soil CO2 productivity. And um, there's something I, I don't have much experience in myself, but a number of groups have, um, have uh, sampled the soil water and looked at the characteristics of the, of the, of the um, water in the soil porosity. In the cave environment, clearly we're interested in, in the cave air, air temperature, humidity, PCO2 of the cave environment. Ventilation strength and direction is something which um, is something which uh, is, is really important and it's not widely appreciated just how important this is. Then there's the cave drip water. You can measure drip rates on various parameters. Um, you can collect calcite. You can, you can farm calcite um, on, in, on glass plates uh, to look at the relationship between the uh, rainfall isotopes and the calcite that you're growing. And then back in the lab, you can take um, samples of water, air, um, et cetera, et cetera, back to the lab to measure all these uh, elemental and isotopic parameters. So let's talk about the easiest one first, which is temperature. Now, as I said already, temperature is, in, you need to know temperature if you're going to reconstruct drip water from the oxygen isotopic composition of calcite. And the, the widely held assumption is that the cave interior is somehow related or, or approximates the local mean annual air temperature. By and large, this is within limits. This is, this is broadly true for in some parts of the cave. But remember that the cave interior temperature is a balance of, of heat inputs. There's the geothermal heat coming up um, from underground. Then there's um, conducted heat, advected heat, which is coming into the cave from the Earth's surface. So shallow caves, shallow roof caves, tend to be more strongly influenced by solar radiation and by um, heat coming in through conduction and advection. And deeper caves tend to um, 
pick up more of the uh, geothermal inputs of heat. But it's the easiest parameter to log. Well, you can just go in there and just wave a thermometer about, as, uh, as Jack is doing. But there's a variety of very inexpensive and generally very reliable temperature loggers out there on the market. I don't have experience of all of these. This is one that we use, which is um, made by Gemini data loggers. These have been very robust, and um, the, the, the way you get the software, the way you get the data out of this is by connecting a cable. This is the only thing I don't like about it so much, is that you need a cable and you need to download the data um, through a wire. And if you're doing this in the cave, you can have problems with damp and corrosion on the connectors, but uh, generally it's quite successful. There's a, there's a group of um, data loggers, temperature loggers made by, by Hobo, and now their claim to fame is that they have an optical link. And you put the data logger into a shuttle, so there's no wires involved, and this um, sh shuttle will download and store the data as you go around the cave. Um, there are some very ch inexpensive um, data loggers around. There's iButton, which is very, very, uh, just, a, just a, um, maybe 20 or 30 euros. All of these will give very good uh, data and um, are quite reliable. The critical issues here with measuring temperature, here's a, a Gemini data logger just um, attached to the wall, and here's another one just hanging from a, from a column. Um, you've got to be a bit careful, and I, I came slightly unstuck on this myself, not realising the significance as to whether you um, just sit them on a rock shelf or hang them in free air. It is better to hang these data loggers in free air. Um, if you sit them on a rock shelf, um, the, the rock temperature will influence the data logger, and the rock temperature can vary through uh, as a result of the ventilation. And in general, it's better to um, if you what you want is the is the air temperature, and it's better to, to hang them so they're they're freely um, surrounded by air. The precision of all these loggers is pretty good. It's what you need. It's about 0.1 degrees C. But they all give slightly different readings. So if you're starting a project and you've got four or five temperature loggers, so put them on the lab bench, let them all equilibrate at the same temperature, and check that they're all giving the same reading. Because you can, they may be, they may be fairly precise in that, they, in that the precision may be good, but the accuracy may vary by up to half a degree or more sometimes, and that is significant. Uh, you can set these things logging for any interval you want, for just a few seconds to hours or days. Um, probably hourly is probably sufficient for most projects, unless you're really looking at uh, rapid local effects, such as the impact of uh, visitors or, or you know, very strong ventilation. And they're pretty reliable. It, with fresh batteries, you can leave these for two years and come back and you'll get a, a record. Um, what do you expect? Well, as I said a few slides ago, um, cave temperature is controlled by a number of factors, in, um, including um, surface radiation, geothermal radiation, but also ventilation and water movement can also uh, modify the temperature of the cave environment. Um, this is a record um, here from, from Ian and Andy's book, which shows the outside temperature and the cave temperature, and they're out of phase. This is extremely common for shallow roofed chambers where the, there is an influence of the summer solar radiation, as we found out in, in, in France, um, migrating through the shallow roof up to uh, 5, 10, 15 metres of rock. And then this heat front then enters, affects the cave, by which time the season has moved in, into the winter season, so the cave is warmer in the winter than it is in the summer. Only by a small amount, but it's a, but it's a measurable effect. You get a very big effect in dynamically ventilated caves. This is a record from Gibraltar. This is um, the outside temperature. This is a, a deep cave chamber, which is fairly stable, but it started rising um, in the last couple of years. And this is another chamber, which is affected by strong winter ventilation it never even gets to the mean annual temperature, well, but it does just. And for most of the year, it's um, several degrees, four or five degrees less than the mean annual air temperature because you get very strong ventilation of cold air in the winter, which cools the rock surface, and this persists throughout the year. So even when you get uh, warm summer air coming through, 
these chambers act as a fridge and they're and, and they're cooling the air. So there's there's more to temperature than meets the eye. Humidity. This is something which we're very interested in, and we assume that caves are um, very close to 100% humidity, which is true. Humidity is the hardest parameter to measure precisely. There are plenty of handheld devices like this, which will give you quite useful spot measurements, but they, they're only uh, quoted to be accurate up to 95% uh, relative humidity. And we're interested in the last 5%. I mean, you know, it's, it's in terms of uh, evaporation and um, isotopic effects, it's really, are you at 100 or are you at 99.5 or 98? That's the important range. These probes, um, they rely on uh, capacitance or, um, or, or properties of a, of a polymer film. And if you have any condensed moisture on these probes, then they just die. They just stop giving you reliable results. And if you attempt to do this with long-term uh, long logging, there's a, a tiny tag device here, which has got a, a humidity sensor on the side. I guarantee they will fail within a day. And, you will, and they will work for a few hours and, and then you just get bad data from them. The, <coughs> um, the ways to measure um, humidity in the critical 95 to 100% range, um, the options are limited. You can go back to the old wet and dry bulb technique, and several studies have done this, where you stand there and you whirl a wet and dry bulb. Um, above 95%, you're trying to measure less than one degree C difference and you can do this quite accurately using um, thermocouples or thermistors. There's a device called a, the industry standard for, for, very, for very precise measurement uh, is a device called a chilled mirror device but uh, I've not seen these used in, in the cave environment yet. Okay, um, cave air and ventilation. Um, ventilation is enormously important. Um, if you have a cave chamber um, ventilation is driven by a variety of processes. It can be pumped through changes in atmospheric pressure, but it's mostly um, affected by the buoyancy contrast caused by the densities of warm air and cold air. If you have a simple chamber like this with an entrance um, just to the atmosphere here, in the summer, ventilation is inhibited because the air temperature and the air density of the column above the cave is greater, sorry, is less than that of the interior of the cave. So it's a stable system. In the winter, it's the reverse. When the air temperature is lower uh, outside the cave, then there's a tendency for the warm air in the cave to bubble up and you get strong convection. We have multiple entrances. You can generate very strong chimney systems where, uh, you, can, where you can get vigorous convection um, between the upper and lower entrances. So this is important because if you're diluting cave air with um, atmosphere, you're lowering the PCO2, so you're changing the carbonate chemistry quite dramatically. You're changing the carbonate saturation state, you change the growth rate, and you change the kinetic isotopic effects which, you might, um, which, 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 which might occur as a result of this. Um, ventilation leads to unstable temperatures, as I just described, and to low humidity. And ventilation can reverse on a daily or seasonal um, time scale. So if you go into a cave, just don't assume that's how it is, because it could be very different that night, or uh, if you were there in the summer, it could be very different in the winter. And ventilation responds very, very quickly. Uh, you can get very different ventilation fluxes on all time scales, from, from minutes to hours to days to weeks, in response to wind, atmospheric pressure, water flow. So the issues we we, we want to concern ourselves with is uh, detection of air movement in the cave, measurement of the cave air PCO2, measurement of velocity and air turnover rates, and um, also related to this is uh, tracing of uh, hidden connections. This is something which uh, we've been doing a lot of recently. Detection of air movement is really easy. You can generate smoke. There are various um, uh, commercially available smoke sticks which you can buy and they generate harmless smoke, and you can see cave ventilation there or no ventilation there. Um, this is Mark Lucha um, from Innsbruck and he's observing another simple technique here where the wind is um, displacing um, uh, ribbons. Um, this is a technique which we used in um, uh, Gibraltar which I, I can't say is entirely harmless but it's um, very effective. 
Um, these are bottles which have got a, a pad saturated in, um, in hydrochloric acid and, and ammonia. And if you open the two lids, you get very thick ammonium chloride um, smoke. And, um, and this is what we did in Gibraltar. And just by watching where it goes, measuring its speed, you get a lot of useful information. If you really want to measure velocity more precisely, there are lots of handheld devices. This is a, a, a hot wire anemometer. And I've used one of these in Gibraltar. Here it is being used. This is a, 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 a man-made tunnel into a cave. And if you've got a nice regular entrance like this, you can, you can work out the flux very easily from the, from the velocity. Natural caves are far more difficult because they're so irregular. Um, it's difficult to be very precise about the uh, cross-sectional area. And also the flow rates vary quite um, dramatically from the edge to the middle. But you can do it. And there are devices such as these. These are um, ultrasonic or, or Doppler devices. And I've seen these used in caves. This is a, um, a low-cost um, anemometer um, for the marine industry you know, to put on top of a mast of a boat. And I've seen one of these used in, in a cave. And they give um, both um, velocity and direction. Measurement of uh, cave air PCO2. Um, this is relatively straightforward. There are lots of devices out there. I think the device of choice is made by Vaisala, and this is one that uh, I know a lot of people have been using. And it's a, uh, it's a readout here. Um, this is the CO2 probe here. And this is a passive probe in that you just let the air diffuse into a chamber, and it measures the CO2 by infrared spectros spectroscopy. There's a tuned diode and a cavity, and you just measure the, absorb the, abs the absorbance of the CO2 stretching frequency. Now you can get these in a whole wide, um, a whole range of, um, of uh, concentration ranges and you have, to f you have to specify this when you buy them. Um, so you have to know a little bit ahead of what, you, what to expect. Um, uh, people may disagree. Um, my guess is that most caves contain somewhere within uh, 1,000 to 5,000 ppm of CO2. Um, I use a 0 to 5,000 probe, and I also carry a 0 to 2% probe, um, just in case we encounter higher concentrations. Um, there are lots of low-cost alternatives around. This is um, an American um, CO2 logger. They're meant for the, for the um, indoor market. They're not meant to go in caves, um, but some of them survive quite well if it's, um, if it's not too wet. This is one of Jay Banner's loggers from Inner Space Cave in, uh, in Texas. Then there's, there's this very nice device here, which is, um, I'm not, not quite sure the provenance of this, but uh, Mark Lucha from Innsbruck um, has been using these, and these are, I think, are now commercially available, I'm not sure, but, but these are very nice loggers, and they will log for many, many months and record CO2. This guy here, um, the GM70, has got memory, and this will log quite successfully for four to six weeks, as, I, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, the critical issue for CO2 measurement in caves is that human, us, human breath, contains nearly 4% CO2, and you have to be aware of this. Um, you can get away with it by not wearing one of these, um, but if you do it quickly, and if there's a group of you going into a cave, if you're measuring CO2, you go in first, and you go ahead of everybody else, make the measurement quickly, and you'll be all right. Um, if you're sampling air for analysis, this takes a much longer time because you're pumping air into a, a container for analysis. Um, you need a long tube. This is um, Dave Lowry. We're doing this in Gibraltar, but outside has a long tube. And it's, of course, it's windy here, so you can just hold it up in the air. If this was in the cave, you would lay five meters of tube out quickly where you want to take the sample, and then retreat, and then collect the air. You've got to be very careful. This is uh, PCO2 versus time. This is going from 0 to 2 minutes. This is for one of James Baldini's publications. And this was in a 2 meter by 2 meter passage. And the CO2 went up by 16% um, over the space of 2 minutes. And this is a small chamber. Even in large chambers, if it's a, sh a show cave, this is from one of um, this is from Sylvia's paper from 2011. This is the Im impacts of, uh, of visitor numbers. This is um, through the month of August, and it shows very large uh, elevations of CO2 caused by the visitors in the cave. And you can see that natural ventilation brings it back down to a base level over a period of days. So um, you've got to be very careful. 
Um, sampling air for, for isotope analysis. Isotope analysis is a very valuable parameter to measure because it gives you um, information on the source of the CO2 to where it comes from. There aren't too many measure, there aren't too many studies which have done detailed measurements of isotopes and CO2, but I would strongly recommend it if, you, if you're inclined in that direction. Um, groups done it one of two ways. Um, you can use um, uh, these glass vials. Um, for the cave, the cave air that's got a reasonable amount of CO2 in it, um, you can just simply just capture um, the air in a glass vial, open the vial, wave it about, fill it, shut it. Um, and you can measure this very easily on a, on a gas bench or, or a multi-flow type uh, continuous flow mass spec system. Um, I suspect the precision is probably isn't good enough for very low concentrations and certainly not for background atmospheric levels. Um, what we do at Royal Holloway, uh, we have a, a greenhouse gas monitoring lab and so they're very good at doing this sort of thing. So we've adopted their techniques and we use these Tedlar bags. Tedlar is a very impermeable plastic, um, either one or three litres in diameter and um, in diameter in volume. And a, a low volume and a low flow pump, so a little battery powered pump that fills them very, very gently. And there's enough gas in one of these bags, so you can use a GC to measure CO2 and methane, either by GC or, or Picaro, and enough gas to uh, extract for isotope analysis. And this sampling technique, we have the slightly larger samples, is, is, is much better for um, probably for um, uh, precise isotopic analysis of background air in relation to cave and soil air. Uh, continuous logging. This is very interesting and it has many advantages. You get very detailed records and rather than just going to a cave and just measuring a spot measurement, well that's about valuable, collecting um, data over a period of months is, um, is even more valuable. And um, uh, the humble Vaisala GM70, this is one that we, we just left in a cave in France. That, it's, a, it's an old show cave that is no longer a show cave, so it's a secure site we know the owner, so we just leave it there, and it logs hourly for six weeks. And this is the record that we've got over many years now, and it's um, and it, this is a very effective way of doing it. Jay Banner uses a similar device here, um, but he puts it in a pelly case, and the probe is um, sticking out of the side of the pelly case. And um, the the Texas Group um, have been using that type of enclosure to protect the Vaisala. Um, the uh, Yes, uh, they, they, these, these systems do do work quite nicely indeed. Um, the, what we've been doing in Gibraltar, we've been uh, interested in, uh, in measuring from several places at the same time. So you can't see the, the CO2 logger here because it's got its lid off, but it's, it's a LICOR, uh, industry standard CO2 instrument. And the way that we do it in Gibraltar is to use a pump and we've laid tubing, you know, six mil polythene tubing around different parts of the cave and the data logger um, switches um, channels and it sucks on one tube for a few minutes, makes a measurement and then sucks on another tube. We have two of these systems, one up in the upper part of the rock and, and another one in, in the lower part of the rock. So we have data from, from 13 locations over a very wide altitude range but that invo involves putting in over 800 metres of tubing um, through the cave system. But you get really amazing data in that um, this is multi-channel data for this cave system. And this really shows you how the cave um, fills up with CO2 and gets flushed, and the CO2 gets flushed out through ventilation. And so you can measure the filling rates, the flushing rates, you can see the effects of atmospheric um, variation and wind direction in relation to temperature. And it's a, it's a very informative um, set of data. Um, tracing of connections. Once uh, if you've got a cave where there are, where there are you know, multiple entrances, it's often not possible. You can see air coming out of a crevice or disappearing down a crevice, and it's um, and it's of interest to try and uh, uh, find out where that air is going to or where it's coming out. So this is uh, my colleague Tim Atkinson here. And he is an expert in water tracing, and he's adapted some of his water tracing expertise to air tracing. And we've been doing it very s simply and very successfully using smelly things like vanillin. You can just warm up some vanillin on a camping stove. You get the wonderful smell of baking sponge cakes. 
And you can smell this. Um, your nose is extremely sensitive to this at very low concentrations. So you, you let off some vanillin or some jostics in this case, and you station people around the cave, and you just sniff. And, it, and, you, can, and you can do some very effective air tracing using this very simple technique. Um, other techniques I haven't got time to go into. Um, measuring detailed CO2 profiles show you where uh, atmospheres coming in. Isotopes give you very good indicators, as well as uh, the traditional um, um, tracers such as radon, and the not so traditional tracer methane, which is something which I've been working on as well. Um, so what does all this tell you? Oh, the colours gone strange. That's, that's odd. Um, this is some of James Baldini's work, where he precisely maps CO2 um, throughout a cave, and with knowledge of the um, concentration of the drip water, he can work out what part of the cave have the CO2 levels for optimum stalactite growth. And if you go, it's a, it's a sort of Goldilocks and Three Bears story here, where it's you know, not enough, just right, and too much. Um, uh, it's in the entrance of the cave here, you get um, uh, two low levels of um, PCO2, so you get very rapid calcite growth, the zone of optimal growth here. And then in the deep cave, where CO2 levels are very high, um, you won't get growth at all because the um, PCO2 is, is, is inhibiting the calcite precipitation reaction. Um, this is a nice classic study here from Christoph, where they um, used abundances and isotopes to, uh, to um, understand dynamic ventilation in a, a beer cave. And we've been using all of these techniques plus, uh, plus tracing. I don't know if this is going to work. This is silly animation. Come here. Can't see the pointer. <laughs> see it goes. Yeah. Okay. That that one's going. And we've come up with models like like this, where um, where we've got a complex uh, connection of chambers and both natural uh, chambers and artificial tunnels, and the and and the. The, the interlinkages and uh, flow patterns are complex and, uh, and they change seasonally from summer to winter. Not only that in Gibraltar, this is a cross section across Gibraltar, but cave systems are linked and what, and what is going on in one cave up here is being mirrored by what is going on in, a, in, in another cave several hundred metres below it. And you, uh, you'd only begin to understand this through precise measurement of CO2 levels and the, uh, and the flow paths. Right, a um, little bit about um, uh, uh, water measurement. Um, the types of field measurements which uh, you're interested in. Uh, uh, this is a diagram from Ian and Andy's book that shows nicely a cave chamber, and it shows you the, the variety of pathways that water can come from the epicast, um, either directly in through fractures or through some intermediate storage um, to form a variety of speed of them. And my experience is, is that um, you can have speed of them just metres apart fed by completely different fracture systems. Um, the, the kinds of measurements you can make are, are, are the drip rates. You can make a series of field measurements, conductivity, alkalinity, pH actually in the cave. And you can, and you can try and map these flow paths using dye tracing. But most water, chemi the most water chemistry has to be done in the lab, so you need to collect water, water samples um, for, for, for cation analysis as one, as one sample, another sample for anion analysis, and probably another sample for isotope analysis, including uh, dissolved inorganic carbon. So measuring drip dis discharge rates, this is one of the key parameters, is, is to measure the flux of water um, descending onto your speedothem. Um, this is important because it, um, it affects the delivery of um, calcium in, in the materials needed to pre precipitate carbonate, but the drip weight also controls the amount of degassing as well, so the, the interplay can be quite complex. Measuring the drip response in relation to rainfall events is particularly informative because it tells you something about the flow path and the degree of storage and mixing in the aquifer. Now you can do you can measure this in a variety of ways. You, know, you can do this without much equipment at all. You can um, measure drip rates simply by timing the drip interval or by filling a, a measuring cylinder. Um, and or you can use um, tipping bucket devices such as this. This is one of uh, Christoph's 
systems, and a tipping bucket is, is the standard rain gauge device, but you've got to be careful in caves because of the precip precipitation of calcium carbonate can, uh, can upset mechanical devices. Well, this is an acoustic drip logger called a stalagmate, which you can just put beneath the drip and um, perch on top of this sort of stalagmite. These are slightly more immune to, um, to calcite. This one is from this is this one from, from Pool's Cavern, where you get very rapid uh, carbonate growth, and I think it still functions even with quite a thick layer of, uh, of carbonate on it. The critical issues um, um, are that mechanical devices they need maintenance because of the calcite deposition problem. Um, if you're measuring um, drip rate, you need, to, you need to convert the drip rate to drop volume. You can do this just by calibrating it by, um, just by measuring drops in the measuring cylinder. Or if you, but what's important is, is that uh, whilst you can assume 0.25 mils per drop is a, is a pretty good approximation, the volume does depend um, quite dramatically on the geometry of the detachment point. This is some work we did um, a few years ago which is the, the drop mass versus the radius of a tube, if it's a soda straw, or the um, curvature of a, of a tip of a stalactite. And you can see how this changes the drop volume quite dramatically. The drop detachment point can move. This is something else we've learned out, we've found out the hard way. You put a, a drip log underneath something dripping, come back and there's months where there's no data. And that's because the drip point of detachment has moved either when the flow rate perks up and gets stronger and the drip detaches somewhere else, or when it dries up, the drip may uh, detach in a different place again. The way around that is to um, put a funnel beneath it and then collect the water and then drop it onto your drip logger. But the, what you end up with is a relationship such as this, where you know the, um, you've got a record of the rainfall events, you can recalculate the recharge through um, uh, um, evapotranspiration. And then these are the drip responses, and these are th three drip responses from, from Gibraltar. And they're all completely different, um, but yet these sites are just a few metres apart. There's one here that, um, uh, that, that when, it's, when the winter starts, nothing happens until January, and then all of a sudden it kicks in, and then, and then, then decays, kicks in, then decays. There's this one here, where there's a very close correlation um, between the rain events and, uh, and the drip rate. And this one here, which is a seepage flow, this is a very low value of uh, drip rate here, and it just meanders along, not changing hugely. So those measurements tell you something about the amount of storage and the, and the pathways. Um, the measurements you can make on site in the cave are basically uh, conductivity, um, pH, and alkalinity. And the conductivity and pH, you get uh, commercially available probes, and these are very, uh, there are lots of types of these, and these are fairly simple to use. Alkalinity, you, you may know if you've done this already, is a titration, and you use a, a digital ti titrator, and you titrate against bromopisol green, which goes from a green color to a, to a purple color. Um, now, the, the issues here is that um, the calcite chemistry is strongly affected by degassing. So you take your drip water sample, and it's degassing. The clock's ticking, and it's degassing as time goes on. So you've got to make the measurement quickly. Ideally, you make these measurements in the same cave environment before you leave the cave, and sometimes it's, not, it's just not practical to do that. Um, but you can get away with it if you store these in uh, tightly concealed containers with no headspace, and you measure it outside or in the caving hut or wherever um, within an hour or two of the collection, and this is a, um, a compromise. Um, uh, calibration, reproducibility, conductivity is pretty good. pH measurements are notoriously challenging because of drift and instability, particularly when you go from the uh, calibration standard into very low ionic strength background, background water. It can take a long time for these uh, for the probe to stabilize. Um, and yeah, I'll move on quickly. This is a cautionary tale here. This, this just brings home the importance of doing it as quickly as possible. This is what happens if, if you have a, this is what I, an experiment I did in uh, Gibraltar. I had a beaker, just an open beaker, sitting in the cave. This was fresh drip water, 25 milliliters in a beaker and 50 milliliters in a beaker. This is time in hours. And this is pH, and it shows just how quickly the pH changes through degassing. 
This is the delta 13C of the dissolved inorganic carbon. This is the raw drip water as it comes out of the roof. And within hours, it shifted from minus 16.5 to minus 14. So this is something which you've got to do very, very quickly. Um, when you get a lot of data, uh, you'll find that um, very often um, some drip sites have got a very different chemistry to other drip sites. So why is that? Well, you can get more information on the flow path through, through dye tracing. This is what something which we did in, in Gibraltar, where uh, you use a fluorescent dye. We used a blue dye and a yellow dye. We put the blue dye in vertically above the cave. Um, the beds are dipping steeply like this, so we put the yellow dye in along the, the dip of the bed. And again, you get informative. Um, what you do is that you, you put a, a catchment, some tarpaulin, you put the dye in a bucket, you dig a hole, put the dye in a bucket, and you wait for it to rain. And you deploy um, um, cotton sensors, you, you just um, cotton buds, which are not fluorescent, and you just put them in the water under the drips in different places. And you, just, you can see within a few weeks or a few hours or a few weeks um, where this water is coming through. And the upshot of this story is, is that um, we had some drips being fed down dip and some drips being fed through the fracture systems directly from the, from the roof. A sampling for laboratory analysis, as I've said already, it's vital to understand the degassing state. If you're collecting water, that takes time. So you've got to collect it in a, in a container. You're collecting perhaps 50, you know, 25, 50, 100 millilitres of water. It's vital to understand the degassing state at the time of collection. Is it taken almost immediately as the drip encounters the cave chamber? So then, the, the, so then you're capturing the calcite equilibria that represents more closely the undegassed drip water, or have you just let it accumulate in a beaker or, an, or, or in a bottle? So has this water degassed um, to the ambient cave cave conditions? You've got to be careful. You've got to ask yourself: Well, how long has that water been there for? Has the environment remained constant? Has the P PCO2 remained constant? Sometimes you, you can have secondary exchange between humid air and the water itself, and um, uh, just leaving a container of water there collecting for weeks and months, um, you can get misleading uh, results. Um, the ways of capturing undegassed water, well, you can plumb them up. You can put silicone tubing over a straw and then lead it into a sealed container like this. Or another technique we've used is just to use a syringe and you just capture, you put the syringe up the soda straw and you just capture the water straight away. Um, again, this is an experiment that we did. This is um, how pH in delta 13 c changes at source coming out of the roof. pH is about um, 7 pH units. delta 13 c minus 16.8. And then you collect it in a um, beaker to measure the drip rates. So the pH had uh, risen to 7.06. You leave this into a container. This is just um, a very common way of doing things. You don't need any special containers. A, a clean drinks container such as this will do, and which is just left to overflow, and you get another value here. So you've got to be aware of, um, of, of, of where you're capturing this water and how long it's been sitting around for, because the chemistry changes quite uh, dramatically. Um, if you're measuring, you've got to, ideally you've got to take three separate samples. Um, one sample for cations, which you acidify with, with nitric acid to prevent solid precipitation, so you, don't, so you don't lose any metals from the solution during storage. Another sample of raw water um, for, for isotopes and anions can be collected, can be measured on the same sample. You've got to be slightly aware that uh, biological action can eat up phosphate and, and nitrate, but, um, uh, but that's something you've got to be aware of. Um, and for um, isot and for, for um, DIC, if you're measuring the, the isotopic composition of the carbonate, um, bicarbonate in the water, um, this is very prone to, um, to, to degassing and biological action. The best you can do is to um, seal it in dark glass, um, poison it with uh, mercury chloride, or you can eject um, the drip water as collected into um, you know, pre-acidified exotainers, uh, which you can put straight onto the machine when you get back. Um, automatic sampling is so something which is a very popular topic, and uh, a lot of intellectual and mechanical skills have gone into trying to devise a way to do this. I must say that, the, that none of these have been hugely successful. They do work for some of the time, um, but, they, but not all of them work for all of the time. There are two ways of doing it. You can do it 
passively, and there are ways where you can collect water and then fill up a cascading, um, uh, well, as a cascade, you fill this one first, this one second, third and fourth. Put a one-way valve there, so you minimize mixing, and that's one way of doing it. Or you can go the whole hog and um, build a, a carousel driven by a motor with perhaps a microprocessor controlling it. Um, all, all of these techniques have been tried. This is uh, Heather Stoll's technique here, where you have a carousel leading into lots of containers. This is, uh, we've seen this picture already. This is Pauline Treble and her hedgehog device, which is a cascading device, which uh, works very well. And this is um, Hannah Sundquist's system here, where she's plumbed up various drips here to collect water. And don't ask, they are what you think they are, but they, <laughs> but they, but they are very effective at uh, collecting water. Two minutes? Two minutes. Okay, I'll just wrap this up. Um, just a, f a couple of comments about the surface environment. Um, meteorology, this is important, and there are lots of ways of doing this uh, discreetly, or not so. Um, the soil environment, um, this is something where, um, where uh, you would normally um, measure a calibrated pit, put a the temperature controller, uh, the temperature logger in there. Then you can get the CO2 out either by using a spike and pumping the air out, this is just a metal tube, or putting these um, sampling cups, which is uh, a technique which we went to. So you bury these, these let, these let the CO2 diffuse in, but keep water out, and then you can pump out the, uh, the CO2 for analysis. Um, the problem with monitoring is that you need a cave where you can be sure that your kit's going to be there when you come back. And um, it, you, you have to trust to, to luck a, a little bit. Um, sometimes you have a cave which is um, nicely gated, su such as this one. But it really helps, if, you, if it's a show cave especially, if you explain what's going on with your monitoring. And the, and the tour guides love it because it's something to talk about. Um, know your enemies. Uh, there are many enemies to cave monitoring. And this is just a few of them. I could tell you a hundred stories of, um, of uh, what can go wrong due to um, unforeseen circumstances. Um, you can get stuff pinched. Uh, bats are a nuisance. If you have a, have a we learned the hard way, if you balance a drip logger on a stalagmite, which has a flat flashing light on it, bats will fly into it and just knock it off the stalagmite. And uh, so you do this in India, come back a year later, and the stalagmite, stalag the, the drip logger's on the floor, and it's been knocked off by bat. Uh, insects, uh, rats are a real pain. They eat wires and cables and batteries. In Gibraltar, monkeys don't monitor anywhere with monkeys. Sheep and goats, they eat everything. Um, the other ha hazards are um, getting water into the instruments. If you change the batteries, make sure that you seal everything up properly. Corrosion, floods, anticipate water levels, make sure your logging stuff's not going to be washed away as mine was in Scotland. Um, and so it goes on. Um, I shall stop quickly. Um, the lessons learned are that the linkage between environmental factors and proxy response isn't always intuitive. This is what logging, this is what cave monitoring is going to tell you. Uh, cave temperature is not so intuitive. Um, precipitation, recharge, and drip rates are decidedly non intuitive and quite often non linear, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so. If you're going to do this, um, any environmental monitoring is valuable. This is the take-home message. Measure something when you go into your cave. If, if it's just measuring temperature from CO2, do a profile from the entrance to the deep cave. This is a very, very informative. Measure some drip water chemistry. If you're coming back again, then you can deploy some temperature loggers at the entrance. And these can always be quite effectively hidden. Um, engaging local help is the key to successful long-term monitoring. Get a local interest group get the local caving group to come and look after your kit for you, and this will um, reap dividends. Um, and how long do you have to do this? Uh, well, I don't, um, how long is a piece of string? Um, not long enough. Uh, you, you keep going this for a lifetime, and it still wouldn't be long enough. This is uh, Gibraltar, where we thought five years was long enough. Then we've got a wet year here, and then all of a sudden the drip responses and the temperatures change quite dramatically. So if you turned your back after five years, you'd think you understood it. But you've got that one more, that one final wet year, exceptional year, and it gives you a different story. Okay, I'll stop now. Thank you all for listening. There's some reading there. I shall put this up on the website so you can look at this um, some other time. Thank you. Thank you.